Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Shining by Stephen King. Now, it may surprise you to know, I don't particularly like this book. It, it's, it's okay. I don't think it's Stephen King's best, and I'm a big King fan. Now, bear with me here while I explain all of this. Basically, The Shining is the first ever Stephen King book that I read, and at the time, I think I gave it a three and a half out of five. I thought there was a lot of backstory, to, like too much backstory, it was quite slow paced. I didn't care for any of the characters, so I didn't really care what was happening to them. And overall, I just wasn't too impressed, I thought that the movie was better, and at the time, it put me off reading Stephen King, and for maybe two or three years I never read any more of his books, and then I picked up another one of his books, I can't remember which one, and that was when I finally really got into his work. So, the reason that I read The Shining is for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon, so the April challenge was uh, reread a book that you had mixed feelings about, and um, the reason I have mixed feelings about it is because it was my first Stephen King book, and I didn't really enjoy it, but at the same time, it was my first Stephen King book, and he's now one of my favourite authors. So I thought perhaps with a reread, I might sort of change my opinion of it. I'll get to that in a minute. First, let me read you the blurb here. So, from the world's best selling author, The Shining. Danny is only five years old, but in the words of old Mr. Halloran, he is a shiner, aglow with psychic voltage. When his father becomes caretaker of the Overlook Hotel, his visions grow frighteningly out of control. As winter closes in and blizzards cut them off, the hotel seems to develop a life of its own. It is meant to be empty, but who is the lady in room 217? And who are the masked guests going up and down in the elevator? And why do the hedges shaped like animals seem so alive? Somewhere, somehow, there is an evil force in the hotel, and that too is beginning to shine. So, for this reread, we listened to an audiobook. I actually listened to it with my girlfriend as well, and she quite enjoyed it. She thought it was pretty good. So again, I guess take my thoughts on this one with a pinch of salt, but... It was the same, I had the same experience. It was exactly as, as I remembered it. it. There was too much like backstory to it. The characters are fundamentally unlikable. Even Danny, I didn't like him because I don't like children. I think the only character I do like is Dick Halloran because he's a legend. And what's odd is that more recently I have read the sequel to The Shining, Doctor Sleep, and that features like a grown up Danny. And I really like Doctor Sleep, I think it's better than The Shining by quite a considerable amount, at least for me, I enjoyed it a lot more. So I don't know, I don't really know what to say, because I, I don't really want to upset people. I don't, want to, I don't want to upset people who are massive Stephen King fans and who read this back when it was published in like the 1980s, before I was born, you know. I don't know, it seems to me, it's like one of these books that there's, you almost don't have no right to criticise it. I mean, I'm not saying that my books are better than The Shining, I just don't think it's Stephen King's best, and by a long shot, I would say this is below, like, the middle. Just, like, even just random ones, like, Doom a Key, that was better than The Shining. <laughs> like, I don't... So if it, but it, it, I, I guess the reason that people like The Shining so much is that it's one of his earlier books. I don't know, and as well I think that The Shining was one that was written while he was having a lot of his problems with alcoholism, and I think you can tell. <laughs> Despite all this, I mean, I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it by a long shot, I mean, it's still it's fine. But I also think as well, if you are if you want to get into Stephen King, I would not start with The Shining, because I think he has better books that are going to grip you more, and that are just going to want make you want to read more King. Like I say with me, when I read The Shining, I, I kind of thought, oh well, I know what Stephen King's like now, so I don't have to read any more of his books. And then again, I, I picked one up, I think maybe like The Green Mile or something, I was like, well, this is different. And then read some of his others, and I was like, well, actually, he is a really good writer. He just rambled a bit in this one. I did find it funny that it starts with a job interview, because... That's actually quite similar to some of my own work, so informally, that starts with a job interview. Dan Roberts goes for a job interview to be a potential web developer at this this startup. And also, the Lightfold books, in a way, the series kind of starts with an interview, because Miley goes along to be interviewed to work at Lightfold's detective agency, and that, that's kind of how the partnership is formed, you know. There were some good quotes, so Wendy's mum said about Jack, he said, The welfare lines are full of educated fools with big ideas which is very true. I think it's also a good way to describe Jack Torrance. Danny was born with a call, and it's kind of like the legends, so in, in, in the kind of old legends or the wives' tales, if a baby was born with a call, which is like skin over their eyes and whatnot, that has to be removed, then uh, it was said to be a sign that they have like the second sight, and so I wondered if that's why he has the shining. I guess that's what King was trying to imply there. Yeah, I got, wrote down Dick Halloran is my favorite character. 
He, I think it was him who said, all mothers shine a little bit, at least until their kids grow up. I mean, the actual concept of The Shining is great, don't get me wrong, I just don't like the execution. After they talk to a psychiatrist about the call, uh, the psychiatrist says, it's not extrasensory, but good old human perception, which in Danny's case is unusually keen. But it is extrasensory. I mean, it is proved by the events of the novel that it's extrasensory. Because otherwise he wouldn't have been able to call Dick Halloran across the ether or whatever, but... I've wrote down as well, uh, Danny's character allows us to see some of the innocence of childhood, like when he's he gets worried that the men in white coats are going to take him away to the sanitarium, because he doesn't really understand it, you know. Another thing I've written down, I've never been too much of a fan of King's writer characters. It just sort of feels cliche. Even the way that he does it, he does give do it justice, you know, he does make them feel like writers. But I just think writers writing about writers is just a cop-out, you know, they say you should write about what you know, yeah. But when, you, when you're a writer writing about a writer, I don't know, it's just writerception. I, I've never liked that really, and even though King does it better than most, I still don't particularly like it. Then Wendy asks Danny if uh, Jack, if, if the dad has been drinking, and little Danny says no, but he swallows back not yet, because he knows it's only a matter of time. Because obviously Jack's an alcoholic or a reformed alcoholic. I mean, again, it's a, it's a booze book as well. Part four of this is named Snowbound, and I wondered if that's named after the Bram Stoker book. I would imagine that as a Dracula fan, King probably did a little bit more digging and knows about Snowbound. He might even have read it. And in fact, Snowbound is basically about a group of sort of traveling actors who get stranded in the snow and tell each other stories to pass the time. So you can kind of see how there are influences of that in terms of the overlook being cut off by the snow. And actually, I do like the way that snow is used to cut them off from the rest of society. It reminds me of And Then There Were None by Agatha Christie or any kind of locked room mystery in And Then There Were None. Everybody's stuck on this island and they can't get off and there's a murderer in there and it's very much the same. In The Shining, they're trapped in a hotel and there's a murderer in there. I did think because we were doing it with an audiobook, it gave me more time to think about the events of the story, if that makes sense. Like, I analysed the story more than I did when I first just physically read it, but at the same time, I also kind of phased in and out of it. For The Shining, I think the audiobook does make for a better reading experience. I don't know, again, because you can phase in and out of it, you don't have to force yourself to read all of the crappy backstory bits that just don't seem to add anything, you know. The scene with Lloyd in the bar is my overriding memory of the entire book, and so when it happened again, I was like, oh, we're at this bit. I also liked the throwaway story about the, there was a kid on a scooter who was scooting down the road, and he went into a chain that had private keep out on... Uh, sign on the chain and it decapitated him which I mean I thought that was the best part of the book was this story this throwaway story about the kid and again because of King's writing style it has no bearing on the rest of the story I think that's my problem with The Shining is that in King's other stuff even when he does dig really deep into the background and kind of goes off on tangents and stuff it relates much more to the story it even sometimes ends up having like an influence on the story Whereas in this one, I don't think it really did. Like, sure, Jack is haunted by the ghosts of this kid that he used to teach. Which I really didn't care for that entire storyline either. I was like, well... Yeah, I don't know. And I think as well, this is something where you need to not know what's going to happen. So, like, the whole red rum thing just falls flat if you've already seen the movie. Granted, the ending of the story is slightly different. And uh, my girlfriend even picked up on it, which I was impressed by, because I think she's probably only seen the movie once or twice. And she was like, this didn't happen in the movie. And I was like, yeah, because in the movie it ends with uh, Jack going into the, uh, into the maze and freezing to death. And in the book, he forgets to stoke the boiler and the boiler explodes. And actually, it is better done in the book. But I think part of that is because the imagery of the boiler is constantly throughout the book kind of foreshadowing it. But again, I knew what was going to happen, so it just... Seemed It seemed a bit too much. There was too many references to the boiler. There should have just been one or two, I think, and then it would be more a surprise when it does happen. Also, when Halloran comes back to help them, that fell flat because I knew it was going to happen. So, what, what was funny, though, is the narrator kept on shouting, Dick, please come, while pretending to be a six-year-old boy. He also kept on dropping the N-word, which, like, don't get me wrong, I don't hold it against King for using it, even though this is a more recent publication. The reason is, is because King's using it, the hotel is using it to try and stop Halloran from going to it. So I think it's actually quite important that he uses it, you know. I think it works in that, in that sense, and I'm not going to call him racist for having his evil hotel use racist terminology. Here's Becca! Hi. 
Hi. That's irrelevant because I'm reviewing The Shining. Oh, okay. Yeah, even though that line is not in the book because Jack Nicholson just ad-libbed that line. So we got to that part of the story and it made me laugh because look, it's on the cover of it as well. Like that scene is the cover of this book and it doesn't even really happen. No. I mean, he does break into the bathroom to be fair, but he doesn't say here's Johnny and that kind of apply implies that he's going to do that. I wonder if King's ever been tempted to go back in and just add that line of di dialogue for future releases. Okay, so a few final thoughts. I mean, I, I thought it was, it's just too slow. It tries to build suspense. But I ended up feeling bored, and that happened the first read, and the second time, it was just even more obvious, because I knew what was going to happen even more, because I'd seen the movie and read the book, you know. I just don't think it held up well for a reread. Jack and Wendy are both unlikable, and I don't like kids, so... I mean, I'm kind of hoping all the way through that, that the Overlook's going to win, and they're all going to die, and then it's disappointing when they don't. What I thought was cool, though, was that the Overlook, the hotel, it wanted Danny. It didn't want Jack, it wanted Danny, because Danny's got the shining, and so I guess he's a more powerful and a, you know, a nicer s metaphorical snack for the hotel. And the hotel basically asked Jack to give them Danny, and I thought that's a bit like the Binding of Isaac, where God asks Abraham to kill his son as like a test of fate. Except here, it's not God, it's the hotel. So, well, actually, it's Grady, it's the old caretaker, the guy who kind of preceded Jack, which potentially makes it Jack himself who wants to do it. But equally, the hotel is evil, so it's a bit like the Binding of Isaac if it had been Satan instead of God, you know as if either of those concepts even exists. I don't think it's scary at all. But then books don't tend to scare me as much as movies. I mean, the movie of this freaked me out, but it was mainly the ghosts of the two twins because creepy children scare the crap out of me. But in the book, it I don't know. I, I, I don't tend to get scared by books in general, but I just didn't think it was scary. It was kind of psychological. So I guess you could find it scary because of that, but it's psychological happening to somebody else. So if you have no empathy for that person, it doesn't really matter. Let them go crazy. The final thing I wanted to mention is that despite the fact that there are lots of kind of end bombs used throughout, uh, it works. Hello, Biggie. Biggie's come to join us. He's come to join us for the end of the review, haven't you, Biggie? Yeah, so the fact that there are lots of uses of the N-word in this, kind of, it, it's fine because it's, like I say, it's the hotel that's thinking them. But what is weird is hearing the clearly white narrator of an audiobook repeatedly <laughs> use it. It kind of made me a little bit uncomfortable, I'm not going to lie, but, you know, I, th I just think in certain instances like that, it works a lot better when you read it than when you actually say it <laughs> so yeah but all in all i mean it was exactly what i was expecting it to be based on my previous reading of it and i can't say that i've changed my opinion on it whatsoever so i'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5 i mean it's it's fine it's just nowhere near king's best and yeah i, I doubt i'll reread it again I am looking forward to rereading The Stand in December though, so there's that. So anyway, there we have it, that's what I thought of The Shining. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you think of this book slash review, whether you agree with the points I've made or not. Maybe you really love it, in which case, fair play to you, as long as somebody is getting more, more out of it than, than I am, you know, uh, but yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.